Okay. All right, sir. We published an editorial. Um, Okay. Yes, it's all right now. No, it was. I had his headphone unplugged. Okay. All right, so now you were published. The the Independent came out strong for moving the courthouse to Kannapolis. At that time, we didn't know that uh, Mrs. C. A. Cannon was ramrodding the campaign in Concord to have it renovated. Uh, Mr. Cannon uh, told us about it uh, laughingly, and. Uh, uh, but uh, didn't uh, make any attempt to stop our campaign. And incidentally, the courthouse bond issue failed. <laughs> uh, give but, us a kind of thumbnail description of Cannon. Uh, you know, I did. I, uh, Charles is the only one I knew. Okay, uh, and, and not. Uh, just tell us about Charlie Cannon. Well, I, I had a, I have a lot of respect for, for Charles Cannon. Um, he he personifies to me the what's what's good about about America. I mean, he's he had high principles and, and, and in integrity, what he told you, if he told you to uh, something, uh, promised to do something, he, he did it. And if he said no to anything, he was, he was against it. But he, he didn't mind, he did, he, he listened and he, and he, Went along with the times. I, uh, one 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 thing I, I remember is uh, when Governor Carr Scott was was running. His uh, he was advocating uh, spending an awful lot of money to build new roads, farm to market roads, and Mr. Cannon <coughs> uh, did not was dead set against that. But a few years later, after Carr Scott's uh, Tenure in office and and uh, the roads were built. Uh, he told me one time he thought that was the best thing that had happened. He said I was wrong about Scott. Uh, he didn't mind admitting it if he was was wrong, which was which was seldom. Uh, he, he was well. I it's just just hard for me to put in to words how much I respect respected Charles Cannon and, and a lot of people here did. No. He seemed to have done something, again, you stop it just a minute, something, he seemed to have had a great influence. Um, yeah, I, I, about the, 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 the blacks uh, getting equal treatment in, in Kannapolis, uh, I think, uh, uh, Kannapolis was uh, ahead of its uh, ahead of the rest of the country in, in uh, uh, handling that situation. The, and and I think I think we were fair, and I think that is uh, goes back to the common sense uh, and conscientious leadership of, of uh, C. A. Cannon uh, when. Uh, I remember when the in Greensboro there was a, a big to do about uh, several black students wanting to eat at the cafeteria downtown and and they couldn't and uh, <clears throat> there was only one eating place in in Kannapolis at that time uh, in the downtown area I don't know where this uh, word. And the, the cafe owner rented his building from uh, Cannon Mills Company. He got the word that uh, if any blacks came to his place to serve him with no with no comment, uh, with uh, treat him as if you would a, a regular customer. 
and uh, I don't know whether one, uh, there was one group, I think, that went in there, and uh, they never came back. Uh, the schools here, uh, I'm not sure they, <coughs> they, would, they, they would be considered proper now, but uh, the school people made, selected uh, black students and assigned them to white schools uh, so that we had at least a token integration. Uh, and and uh, the management at, at the mill company was always sensitive to to what the uh, to the to everyone in the community and and uh, in, including the black they, they knew how they felt they knew the leaders over there uh, would get word if would get word to the management if there's something going wrong in their community and uh, the, the, the mill people tried to straighten it out. Well now this fellow Jones, Reverend Jones, who's been uh, pretty strong, a black minister, has been pretty strong in favor of the unions. Uh, where does all that come from? <coughs> I don't know. I never heard of Jones until the last couple of days before the uh, uh, union vote here. I, I don't know anything about it. Yeah. Okay. I, now, do you have anything you'd like to say before we close up? Um, I, I'm not sure what we've done. <laughs> Can you brief me again? Well, you want to have a different answer. Oh, I. <laughs> okay, thank you. That was great. Thank you very much. And that business about being on the National Guard. <clears throat> Tell us uh, how you got in the cotton mill. The way I got started in the cannon mill was I had worked in the hosiery mill since I was 19, and I quit and got me a job at cannon mill when I was 25. And that's how I got started. And when was that? When I was 25, that was in 67. Uh, I had four babies then. Did you have any, uh, could you tell us about your parents and did you come from a cotton mill tradition? I came from a cotton mill family. My grandfather, my father, my mother, uncles, aunts, cousins, you name it, we all worked in cannon mill. What did they tell you about cannon mills? Well, they always talked about how hard it was to work in cannon mill. And when my mother uh, worked for cannon mill, they, they didn't have air conditioning. And she would come home in the summertime and there wouldn't be a dry thread in her blouse. And it was, it was hard work and it was hot and it was dirty. You know, before you listed what everybody did in the mill, you said, my daddy did this, my granddad did this. And then you told me, what was it, what your granddad used to say about working in the mill? Oh. So could you list what everybody did and what you do where they work? In a real, and then what your granddad thought about, you know, what a job was. My grandpa was a weaver for a cannon mill at Plant 4 for about 40 years, I guess. And if anybody, if he knew anybody that didn't work for cannon mill, they wasn't working. He'd say they wouldn't work in a pie factory. Because they did, and a lot of times they would have a better job than him, but he thought if you didn't work for cannon, you wasn't working. <laughs> and he probably still thinks that. Now, the other day you were spending time with your granddad and you told him what you were doing, yeah. right? Can you yeah. describe that whole little scene for us and what he said to you? When we started the union campaign, I went to see Grandpa. He's 94 years old, and he's been retired, I guess, 29 years. And I went to see him, and I said, Grandpa, you have to holler. I said, Grandpa, we're going to try to get the union in Cannon Mill. He said, you'll never do it. <laughs> Why do you say that? I don't know. I guess he just feels like we'll never get a union in because people still, it's been handed down from generation to generation that the union is bad, that they're the mafia, they're hoodlums, they're criminals, and I guess that's why he said that. Have they ever, did 
did you grow up with uh, stories about the, the unions in, in the mills? Yeah, I grew up with stories about the unions. All I've ever heard about was strikes. That's the main battle cry. And uh, we have a bunch of store buildings now down on Central Avenue, and they call them the union stores because in 34, that's where the union held their meetings. And to this day, it's called the union stores. And I'd like to show them to y'all. Now, what could you tell us about the, uh, the 1921 strike? Did you hear anything about that way back in 21? The only, the only thing I've ever heard about strikes was uh, they said that when the, the union tried to get in back, they called it back in the olden days, they didn't tell me any dates, but they said that the people liked to starve to death. And they said one union came in town and got their money and left town and didn't care what happened to them. And that's one reason that people don't like unions today. They still remember that story. Now, did they ever describe to you uh, the National Guard, the soldiers coming here during 34? No, they never told me anything about the National Guard, but my aunt remembers. My great uncle was a union organizer, and his brother, which is my grandfather, was against the union. And my grandpa crossed the picket line, and my great uncle was an organizer, and he tried to talk grandpa into voting for the union, but he wouldn't. He thought he'd starve to death if he went on strike. And uh, my great uncle stayed with him about two weeks, and he carried a gun. It was strapped to his leg, because it was tough on unions back then. And grandpa had six kids, and he was afraid for him to stay there. And so my uncle finally decided to go stay with the union organizers. And back then they had to sleep on cots. They had to, they had rented this building, I guess, and they slept on cots. And some people tell me that it was on Sycamore Street where they stayed. And that's right behind Plant Four. Now, when when tell them, did, did what did you know about the thirty fourth strike? Did you ever hear much about that? I don't know anything about it except when we started this union campaign, I didn't even know my uncle was an organizer, but my daddy's sister started telling me about it. And I, had, I didn't even know that until then. How do you I, feel about that? My uncle being, oh, lordy, I like it. No, they say my uncle being an organizer. My uncle being an organizer thrills me to death. I told my aunt that it must be running in my blood. <laughs> It does, it thrills me. Now, could you describe <coughs> describe the town growing up here, what you thought about the mills, and how how what how the town and you know why why you think the union is a dirty word around here. But base it on, you know, the way that you grew up here and what you saw. Well, I grew up in Kannapolis. I was born at Cabarrus Hospital down here between Kannapolis and Concord, and I grew up here. And my mother always told me all my life to get me an education and not work in Cannon Mill. But I was hard-headed, and when I got 15 years old, I wanted to get married. And she didn't want me to, but I did anyway, and I got married, and I quit school. And I, did, I couldn't go to work then. I was too young. And, like I said, I went to work when I was 19 in the hosiery mill, and then when I got 25, I went to work in the mill. But my mother never did want me to do that. And uh, the only thing, every time you mention union, strike is right up there beside of it. If you mention union, like if you would mention boy, somebody would say girl. If you would mention black, somebody would say negro. If you say union here, they're going to say strike. That's all they can remember. And there's been a lot of lies told about them strikes, too. The strikes were, I don't, I wasn't there, but I just don't believe it was as bad as people said it was. It could have been, but. My, my aunt, my daddy's sister said that when uh, Grandpa was working and they was on strike, she said she didn't remember anybody starving. She said they had plenty to eat, but of course, Grandpa worked, he didn't strike, so I don't know. Now, the, they've shown a lot of these pictures of strikes here. 
And we have a lot of pictures of the National Guard being here and the, the machine guns around and so forth. We know from the documents that Mr. Cannon asked the governor to send those guards here. Mm -hmm. But here, everybody says, the Union brought them here. Could you talk about that? Well, uh, talking about the government sending the guards here, and everybody says the union, the union get blank, gets blamed for anything bad. They still do. Anything bad that happens, the union did it. But if they do like this pension fund, the union was the cause of Terry Sanford coming here. They was the cause of us getting the national attention. But you get people around here to admit that, it'd be like pulling teeth. They will not admit it. Some people will, but some people won't. They, like my daddy, he says that old union. I'll have on union buttons and badges, and he'll still say that old union. <laughs> now, uh, when you were, you went to school here, did you? Yeah. Could you describe what kind of history they taught you about unions? They never did teach anything about unions in school. They never did mention it, because that's a dirty word in Kannapolis. The teachers around here don't even belong to unions, I don't think. Did you know Mr. Cannon? Yeah, I knew Mr. Cannon. Could you talk about him? All I know about Mr. Cannon is everybody always told me this was a one-horse town and Mr. Cannon was the horse. He owned the town. He owned the town, the newspaper. He owned everything. Can I say something about this? Yes, sure. This article right here appeared in the... Daily Independent on June the 24th, 1991, we had just started our union campaign. Had Mr. Cannon owned Kannapolis then, this article would not have appeared in the Daily Independent. Could you hold it's, it up there just a moment, Jamie? Let's just go in and get a very tight close-up. Why don't you tell us what it's about? It's about the Fieldcrest executives and their pay. And Ron Ely... No, 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 no. Okay. got to hold it. Okay. Ron Ely made a million and a quarter the last year he worked for Cannon. When he was asked to resign, he left with 790000 severance pay, not counting his stock and other stuff. And during this time, the company was telling us that they were losing money. And even the anti-union people got mad about that. So that's pretty good when you make them mad. Now, we oh, and let me say one more thing about Ron Ely. His uh, pension from Cannon, from Phil Chris Cannon is 17000 a month. A month. And some of the workers don't even make that a year. Now, you have been writing to the papers, I believe. Could you talk to <coughs> me about that? Yeah, I've, been, I've wrote a letter to the Daily Independent in the viewpoint page, the letter to the editor. And I told them that if the businessmen and the preachers would stay out of our business, we could get us a union because we need a union. Here's a letter from a Baptist minister condemning the union and telling people not to vote for the union. And you can't see his pit. He, there's no picture on there, but he's black. They're trying to change the they're trying to change the black people's mind. They think only black people want the union, but that's a lie. White people do too. And this is uh, Emanuel Stowe. He's been a bondsman in Kannapolis for, I'm 49 and I've been knowing him all my life. And he used to get my daddy out of jail when he was drunk. And I was very disappointed with Mr. Stowe because he knows how hard the working people have it here. How have the union handled this business of the supposed conflict between the blacks and the whites? That's a hard thing. Yeah. The union, I don't know how they handle it, but they're handling it well because the blacks and the whites are coming together. And when you go to a union meeting, everybody seems like one. Like I told some of my friends in 85, I didn't know what real friends were until I met the union organizers and we started having union meets because everybody's for everybody else, all for one. 
and I had never experienced that before. Okay, now we want to counter that no, with, with the all the testimony we've been getting from people around who say that they don't want the union because it's going to split up the town, it's going to make people angry with each other. Could you talk about that? Because you just start off by saying, well, I've lived here all my life and. Okay, hold it. <laughs> but he's a millionaire in property. He really is. He might own the union stores. I don't know. Okay. I forgot what you said. That, hold it just a minute. My mother worked for Cannon Mill 35 years, and she died with brown lung. When she retired, uh, my, me and my husband tried to get her to see a lawyer then and start proceeding to get compensation. She said no. Said I didn't. Cannon Mill didn't ask me to come to work there. I asked them. So she let it go on and go on, and she kept getting worse and worse. And we finally got her to see a lawyer, Jim Lore. He had he had put letters in Canapa's papers telling people if they needed help with brown lung, he would help them. So we went to him. And we had to, we had to end up taking her all the way to Raleigh for a hearing. And the Cannon Mill lawyers was there, of course. And they stood up and said that they knew the woman had brown lung or something seriously wrong with her lungs because you could hear her breathing all over the place. But the statute of limitations had run out so they didn't have to help her. And all she wanted was her medical bill. She didn't want to get rich. That's all she wanted. Now, prior to that, you were working in the same apartment. She was working, I, and then your mother pleaded with you to move, right? And you did. So, can you talk about that? Yeah. First time we talked about that, Cynthia, you got mad. Yeah. Don't, uh, look at me. Don't touch me. Uh, I was working in the spinning room, too. She had already retired with her. I'm sorry. Sorry. I need to say my mother had already retired, so I, I was working in the spinning room. My mother had already retired, and I was working in the spinning room. And I had four asthma attacks in four months and was hospitalized. And uh, the doctors around here have been bought off too, and they said I had asthma. So Mama said, I want you to go to your overseer and tell him to move you to a cleaner area, lint, more lint-free area. She said, I don't want you to end up like me. So I went to my overseer, and he said, Sin, I don't think I can get you a transfer. I said, well, a girl just got one two weeks ago. I said, can't you see if you can try? He said, I'll try. So they sent me to the medical department. They got the nurses trained too. She said, you can't get no medical transfer. I said, well, that ain't what I've been told and I'm going to try. And the doctor there, he was a, he had been a Navy doctor before he came to Cannon. And uh, he said, anybody that had had four asthma attacks in four months needed to be moved. And he got me my transfer. And I had to sign a paper saying that I didn't have brown lung and that I used to smoke before I could get my transfer. And I still got that paper. And uh, so I got my transfer and I haven't had an asthma attack since. So that proves it was lint. How does that relate to you wanting this union and working so hard? Well, I feel like we need a union for better health benefits, but my main beef is fire treatment. Nobody's treated alike in Cannon Mill. If anybody's ever worked in there, they know. Even shifts, the first shift is treated better than second and third. If you're not a pet or a buddy, you might as well forget it. And we thought David Murdoch would end the buddy system, but he, did, he couldn't even break it up. And then Phil Crest came in. They helped a little bit, but not much. And we still got the buddy system. Now, back in 34, <coughs> a lot of people who were active in the unions immediately got fired. Uh, what gives you the courage and assurance that the same thing won't happen to you now? Well, in 85, I was a union activist. That's what they call me in the paper. And the union assured me that if I was fired, that they would be behind me all the way. In fact, about seven or eight people got fired. And they were, the union got them their job back, but they could either take their job or take a settlement. And they took a settlement because the union told them that if they took their job back and 
the Union had, didn't win that time, that the company could turn right around and fire them the next day and there'd be nothing they could do. So they took the settlement. They didn't take their job. And uh, they tell me the same thing now. If uh, I get fired for any reason, it better be a good reason because they can't fire me. I've been on TV and everything. And even a girl I met at the nursing home at, uh, where my daddy is, she's from up north and she knows a lot about unions and she told me since I'd been on television that if they ever fired me before I retire, they have to have a good reason. So that's, it don't bother me. Now, you know, I think, and this is something that a lot of union people ought to know, that that rule about the, go the whole government labor relations and so forth was a result of unions fighting politically for generations to get it in there. Yes. It just didn't happen because of the federal government. That's right. If it hadn't been for unions, if it hadn't been for unions, even the people that work that are not, that don't belong to unions wouldn't be as well off as they are now. I firmly believe that. Okay. I want you to say that and then mention <coughs> the occupational safety and health rules and other rules that are there only because the unions keep pushing for them. The employers didn't push for them, the union did. If it hadn't been for unions, we wouldn't have OSHA now. We wouldn't have any of the benefits that we have now. Even non-union plants benefit from union plants. I'm going to say that. I should say that again. Uh, a lot of people Let don't know say what OSHA more is. Thing. So it's occupational safe and health. Or say protection against uh, brown lung and that kind of thing. Okay. OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health, Admin health Administration. And uh, that's what... They come in the mill. In fact, they've been in Fieldcrest Cannon investigating things that happened. Like this one guy fell. He was on a what they call a dinky, and he fell to the bottom in an elevator. And just recently, all those people got hurt in the elevators. The company was fine, but it, if it hadn't been for unions, we wouldn't have any of that. We would still be back in sweatshops, work, earning thirty cents an hour, working twelve and sixteen hours a day. But you make people around here believe it. They won't. What gives you the courage to keep on? I want me a union. <laughs> Just to say, I got the courage because. The reason I keep on like I am is I want me a union. I want one bad because I feel like the whole community would be better off. And people would learn to stick together. Now people backstab each other and and don't care just so they get to the top. They don't care about the other man. But I, th I feel like a union would bring the community together. If it hadn't been for Philip Morris and that union down there, we wouldn't have got as close to this election as we did. The vote wouldn't have been as close because they helped us a lot. How do you feel about outsiders and unions? What do you mean? Well, the, the people over, we were talking over at the gate said, Oh, it's just some people from New York or people from Atlanta coming oh. in. People around here feel like that the union is the mafia, foreigners come from outer space. And if they would come to the meetings and meet those people, I feel like they're some of the best friends I've ever had. I really do. Can, can you talk about the, the way that, the, that the, the mill has been using history to frame people, what they've been doing, and really go for it, Cynthia. Really think about it. Take it away. They take... Uh, look, 